Shalom Avarim. Welcome friends in Hebrew. My name is Tony Pino and today I would like to share with you on my opinion on why some Bible prophecy teachers today that are looking at the war, the Ukraine and Russia war today, and trying to make connections to Ezekiel 38, 39, the Gog Magog war. They're trying to say, well, it might be this war or it might be a war leading up to it or, you know, they just connect Russia to chapter 38. I'm going to go ahead and show you why I believe they're missing the mark today. Uh, I think this is a good time to do this. Um, you know, there's much talk going on with some of these Bible uh, teachers on uh, how they are watching Russia and trying to connect it all to the end times and so forth. Um, I believe they're off, and I'm going to show you why. And uh, what this will do, of course, is just give you another side to the story, right? We're going to go ahead and look at Scripture. I believe that uh, when you consistently look at it, you will see that that argument is not a strong argument, all right? We're still waiting for this future development of this um, this empire that is to come. I mean, we don't even have the ten horns developed yet. I believe that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is talking about the anti mashiach and his empire and his kingdom, and we're not even there yet. And so uh, there are some people that believe that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is going to happen before the tribulation period, uh, they think it's a war that happens before that maybe helps to open up and lead into the anti uh kingdom being developed and so forth. I think that's off, okay? And just because I disagree with these Bible teachers doesn't mean I disagree with them on everything. I'm not calling anyone a heretic or false teacher or anything of the sort. This is just one area where I would disagree on that. We probably agree in many other areas, Right, and so, uh, and I have friends that hold to this view, and we just disagree on this particular position. Okay, uh, we do want to, though, keep in mind that this war, we want to be praying for both sides. Innocent people are suffering. People are fleeing both countries in fear of their life because of what's happening. Uh, this war is definitely uh, being done through the evil hearts of men, and it's being exposed. Um, so. We definitely want to keep people in prayer. We pray that people will turn to Yeshua, will trust in the Holy Spirit to lead them and guide them and protect them. Amen. And so, yes, we definitely want to uh, pray for those that are taking in the refuge, uh, the refugees and protecting them and feeding them and everything and pray that more supplies will be sent to them. Amen. Now, concerning Ezekiel 38, let's go ahead and go there and I'll show you why I believe that Russia is not even mentioned in this chapter. Amen. So here we are in Ezekiel 38. I'm using the New King James Version, okay, for a particular reason that I'm going to show you. Uh, but I use many English versions. I don't think one is God-breathed or perfect, right? Uh, many versions you're going to have to use to get the context right and, and see exactly how different scholars interpret different words. But the context is king. That's what we have to always remember. So that determines how certain words are interpreted. And everyone does the best they can. All right. We look at the culture. We look at the language. We look at the time that this was being written and spoken. So this all needs to be factored in when we're interpreting a chapter. And that's why we have various views and different opinions. Okay. Now, in uh, chapter 38, starting with verse 1. Now the word of Yahweh came to me, saying, The Son of Man set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus says Yahweh Elohim, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you around and put hooks into your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Tugarma, from the far north and all its troops. Many people are with you. All right, so let's go ahead and start at the beginning here. Let's start with Gog. Gog is a person, okay? It is uh, speaking of a person here in the verses. Son of man, set your face against Gog. Okay. Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh. All right. Of, and up here it says, of the land of Magag, the prince of Rosh. Now, 
the Prince of Roche, I believe, is a mistranslation here. Rosh is correct. That is the Hebrew word used here. But the word Rosh is not speaking of a person, all right? Uh, because some people will say, well, look at Rosh, Russia. It's the prince of Rosh, meaning, you know, it's speaking of the place of Russia. Rosh is a Hebrew word for like head or chief uh, or like first, the first of something. And so this better trans uh, should be better translated as the chief <clears throat> excuse me the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal let me go ahead and take a drink here real quick <clears throat> all right and there are definitely versions that are going to interpret it this way they will say chief prince of Meshech and Tubal so uh, definitely you want to look at the context here you want to look at that Hebrew word all right, and I think you will conclude, you know, I mean, they're kind of doing this because they think, well, you know, Roche sounds like Russia, so they're trying to make that connection that way. It just doesn't work that way. Sorry, but uh, that's not how you do languages, and, uh, you know, any linguistic uh, language person will tell you that. So Gog is a person. He's of the land of Magag. All right, he is the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. So these Magag, Meshech, and Tubal are giving you the place where Gog is from. All right. Now, first of all, I want to go to Numbers chapter 24 because this is where Gog is first mentioned in the Bible. And I think uh, it's rather important for us to see that. All right, so here we are in Bab Midbar, the book of Numbers, chapter 24. We have Balaam, who is a prophet, who is hired by Moab, the king of Moab, um, Balak. And so Balak hired him to curse Israel, you know, because uh, the Moabites, you know, are Israel's enemies. They want to wipe Israel out. So the king of Moab wants Israel to be cursed. So Balak gets a hold of Balaam, wants him to come and prophesy and curse Israel. Okay, so that he could utterly destroy Israel, but Yahweh won't allow it. And Balaam even tells and warns the king of Moab that he can only speak what Yahweh tells him to speak. All right, he can't do anything according to his will, he will only speak according to Yahweh's will. And Yahweh is going to bless Israel and not curse Israel. So this is going to become a problem, but there's a specific prophecy that is being talked about, and Gog is going to be mentioned here. So Let's go ahead and start with verse 3, where it states, Then he, speaking of Balaam, took up his oracle and said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of Yahweh, or the words of Elohim, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by Yahweh, like cedars besides the waters. He shall pour water from his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. His king, speaking of Israel, shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. All right. So his king, and I believe this is speaking of Yeshua, all right. this is speaking of the king of Israel, shall be higher than Agag, and his kingdom shall be exalted. Now, Agag here comes from the Masoretic text, okay, which is a thousand years after Yeshua, roughly 10, 11th century or so, is where we get the Masoretic text, where we get the term Agag being used here. But in earlier manuscripts, we see that the word Gog is used, and I think the Gog is the stronger argument. So his king meaning the king of Israel, meaning Yeshua, shall be higher than Gog, and his kingdom shall be exalted. All right, let me go ahead and show you what I mean. So Gog is featured in the earliest biblical manuscripts. We have the Septuagint, which is 200 B.C., okay, so this is before Yeshua. The Samaritan Pentateuch, 122 B.C., we have the Dead Sea Scrolls which is 150 B.C. We have Aquila of Sinope, A.D. 130. Okay, it's 130 years after Yeshua. We have Symmachus, A.D. 190. And then we have Theodosian, uh, 
AD 150. So roughly, you know, right around a thousand years or so, we have manuscripts that use Gog and not Agag before the Masoretic texts uh, that we have. So I do believe that this is a stronger argument to show that Gog is really what's being spoken of in Numbers 24, that it's a prophetic word about Gog, and that there is a connection between Numbers 24 and Ezekiel 38. Amen? Let's go ahead and go back. So it says, His king shall be higher than Gog. Okay, this should be changed to Gog. And his kingdom shall be exalted. God, Elohim, brings him out of Egypt. He has strength like an ox. He shall consume the nations. His enemies shall break their bones and pierce them with the, his arrows. He bows down. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who shall rouse him? Okay. So I believe personally, and this is just my opinion, but that when Yeshua returns, he first will go to Egypt. I use Isaiah, Yeshayahu, chapter 19. I use uh, that chapter to show that I believe Yeshua is going there first when he returns. And then as he's coming up, uh, he'll come up through Basra. You have Isaiah 63 that shows that he has blood on his garments as he's coming up. All right, before he puts his feet on the Mount of Olives in Zechariah 14. All right, so um, that's just kind of my opinion on that. Uh, when I study the second coming of Yeshua, he's going to be gathering all of Israel from the four corners of the earth as he brings them up into the land of Israel and as he defeats the anti-Mashiach. Okay, it's leading up to that final battle between him and the anti-Mashiach. And so when we get to Isaiah, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 38 and 39, I hold that, uh, it's not speaking of Russia, but it is speaking of the empire of the anti-Messiah. That Gog is, when it's spoken of here, it's speaking of the future anti-Messiah to come. Okay, And so there'll be that final battle that will happen. Now, let's go ahead and go back to Ezekiel 38, and I'll explain a little bit more. So we have Gog here of the land of Magog. And so no connection to Russia here with Rosh, right? It is the chief or head prince of Meshech and Tubal. And prophesy against him and say, Thus says Yahweh Elohim, Behold, I am against you, Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. All right. So for me, when I study this out, this is modern day Turkey of today. Okay. When we look at Magog, when we look at Meshech and Tubal, I believe it is connected to Turkey, modern-day Turkey, which is in the north of Israel. So let me go ahead and show you. So I believe that Ezekiel 38 is talking right about in here, in this particular area here. So modern-day Turkey, all right? And so we have... Uh, Israel right here and they are directly north okay they are directly north and I'm going to talk a little bit here in a few moments about what it means to be from the far north or the uttermost parts of the north okay but I would connect it more with Turkey all right Turkey is going to be a major player in the end time empire of the anti-Mashiach all right this is also where the seven assemblies are in the book of Revelation. This is where all seven of them were, which I think is also a key. The location of those assemblies was chosen by Yahweh for a reason, too. It's where the seat of Satan is, over here in this area. Okay? So, another, you know, particular reason why I'm focusing in more on this area, that I think Gog is speaking of the prince, the chief prince of this land, of this area. So very well, the anti-Mashiach could come from this area. Amen. So in verse 4, it states, speaking about Gog, and that Yahweh is prophesying, I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaw and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, 
Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya, speaking of northern Africa over here, plus Persia would be like modern-day Iran over here. So we're, we're seeing, and remember, there's going to be ten horns that are going to rise up, and then the little horn's going to rise up in the midst of them. You see that in Daniel chapters 7 and 8. You can read about it there. Those ten horns... Uh, are shown where the coalition are. And then, of course, it says that three of them are going to get plucked up as the little horn rises. But they will be coming, I believe, from these areas. So these areas will make up the anti mashiachs final empire, and these armies here will be with him uh, when uh, Yahweh leads him out for that final battle. Okay, And so we also have Gomer here in verse 6 and all of its troops the house of Tugarma from the far north in all its troops. Many peoples are with you. So this is another key verse because some of your versions will say from the extreme north. All right. And so that's why they go all the way up to Russia. All right. And so they think, well, Russia has got to be a part of it. It's the extreme north. So they take that. Uh, they're pretty literal. But the extreme north can be Turkey. Right. And when you really study how Babylon and a lot of these armies came in, the Assyrians and that, they came in from the north. Okay, they came in from the north. So it just could be an expression saying they're coming in from northern Israel. That's where the army is going to be coming down to try and just take out Israel. Okay, uh, so from the far north does not at all have to be Russia, all right? does not all have to be Moscow and so forth. It can be the land of Turkey. And this other uh, idea of the far north, you see this also in Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, let's go there. So remember in Isaiah 14, we have this prophecy that is spoken of, uh, we believe it's about uh, the serpent that was in the garden. We believe Lucifer, the son of the morning star here. Uh, notice what I want to focus in on, though. Notice this, uh, starting in verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, O son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And I will sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Now this idea of being uh, also to sit on the mount of the congregation in the farthest north. Okay, This easily could be counted as Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon, all right? Remember in uh, Psalm 82, Psalm 82, let's go ahead and go there real quick. So it states in Psalm 82, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods, the Elohim, okay? These, for me, are fallen angels. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah, defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and the needy, free them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said you are gods, you are Elohim, and all of your children, and all of you are children of the Most High. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So this is telling me these are angels. Angels are children of the Most High. Okay, These are angels that have been put over the nations. And they have uh, a what congregation of the mighty. God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods. Okay, Traditionally, Mount Hermon, if you were to read the book of Enoch, is known as the place where the angels came down. There were 200 of them and decided that they were going to have relations with the daughters of men. You see that in Genesis chapter 6, how the sons of God came to the daughters of men and saw that they were fair, and they married them, they produced Nephilim, and so forth. Uh, so I do believe that there is a congregation of uh, these mighty ones. Of course, they are fallen angels, 
Yahweh stands. He begins to judge them. They were created to help man to worship Yahweh. But, you know, just like the serpent in the garden fell, these angels have fallen. All right. So, and I'm saying all this because we're talking about the far north, going into the congregation of the far north. He wants to be head of that assembly and so forth. This idea of the far north is just pointing towards northern Israel. It's not pointing towards Moscow or, you know, way up north or so forth. So when we read these passages and you read the whole Bible and you begin to put it together correctly, you can see these, you know, this is how they would have understood it in Bible days. All right. So, uh, again, God stands in the congregation of the mighty, the assembly of the mighty. These are what? He judges among the Elohim. He judges the angels. Remember, Paul said one day, you and I will judge angels. And remember that in Daniel chapter 10, uh, when he was praying, okay, when the angel came to him, he said, I was withstood by the prince of Persia 21 days. Okay, that is an angel over the empire, a fallen angel over the empire of Persia. Okay, and he said, when I go, the prince of Greece will come. The prince of Yavan in Hebrew will come. Okay, that's the fallen angel over that empire. So these are angels that have been placed over empires, placed over men. They are teaching them wicked ways. All right, that's why we have pagan deities and pagan gods that are being worshipped by them, and they're being judged for the wickedness that they have shown mankind. And so Satan, or Lucifer, son of the morning, what does he say he wants to be? He wants to be, let's go ahead and go there again. It says, for he has said in his heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne, above the stars of Elohim, right? Speaking of God, the Father, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. I believe this is Mount Hermon, where the fallen angels have set up their assembly there, okay? He's making his empire, his uh, congregation, okay, of the fallen angels to what? To He wants them higher than Yahweh. He wants to be above Yahweh. Uh, but he is going to be brought low. He's going to be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. Okay? All right, so we have here up in the north, we have Mount Hermon here. Okay? Uh, this is traditionally, like again, I said if you read the book of Enoch, you would see that uh, according to that tradition that the angels came down and created an assembly there, talked to there. This is where they devised their plan. Uh, this is also known over in this area where Baal's um, throne is, okay? Uh, the chief enemy, one of the chief enemies against Israel, the chief pagan deities against Israel. This is where his throne is uh, often located uh, over here by Mount Hermon, right? It's in the far extreme north. And that's what that word can mean when it says the extreme north. These are the peoples. These are the uh, the peoples from the far north that are coming down, right? Modern day Turkey is just north of Mount Hermon up here. And again, this is where Babylon would have came in to uh, take out the first temple and so forth. When an army like the Assyrians and so forth wanted to come into the land of Israel, they came in from the far north. Okay. So in no way do I think, I think you're going too far when you try to make the extreme north or the far north all the way up to Russia. Okay, Within the Bible times here, this is how they would have seen it. This is how they would have known it. So I think it's a better way of translating Ezekiel 38 when it talks about the people from the far north, from Tugarma. Okay. So again, to Garma would be up here in modern-day Turkey, coming from the north, and that would be an extreme north there. So when reading Ezekiel 38, within those first verses, we are really condensing it right here to modern-day Turkey. And that is still a good likelihood to happen here in the future. But this is not speaking of Russia. All right, let's go on.
All right, so we, here we are back in Ezekiel 38, again, uh, verse 6, with Gomer and all its troops from the house of Tugarma from the far north and all its troops. Many people are with you. So the anti mashiachs kingdom, if I am correct, will come, uh, the armies, the great armies will come from there. They will gather to come there, right? And then verse 7 says, prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you and be a guard for them after many days you will be visited in the latter years okay the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many peoples on the mountains of israel all right this would be right the people that have come back to the land the israelites that have come back to the land this uh, event is coming upon them right okay which had long been desolate, they were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely there. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Thus says Yahweh Elohim, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind, speaking of Gog, and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. Now, this passage here, kind of, these set of passages here, kind of set people up to thinking about Revelation 20. Revelation 20, verse 8, mentions Gog and Magog there. And that's after the millennial reign, when they have been dwelling safely with Yeshua. And so then uh, the uh, serpent or the uh, Satan, the deceiver, is released from the pit. And he goes off deceiving many and he forms an army to come against Israel. He surrounds Israel. All right. So some people connect this set of passages with that uh, event happening in Revelation 20. I leave that open. I leave that open. But it is also possible that this is speaking, I believe, of the anti-Mashiach and the final battle that he will have with Israel at the end, amen, uh, and that Yeshua will come at that time and save Israel, okay? We see, uh, I believe there's a connection to Daniel chapter 11 with this. Let me go ahead and go there with you real quick. So in Daniel chapter 11, starting with verse 14, it says, at the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, speaking of the anti mashiach okay, the anti mashiachs kingdom. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelming them and passing through. He shall also enter the glorious land, speaking of Israel, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape his hand. Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. This is like modern day Jordan today, okay? He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape him. This is why in Ezekiel 38, you can see northern Africa is with the anti mashiach because he will take over that area of Egypt. Okay, so that's why he is with them in Ezekiel 38. Now he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all precious things of Egypt, also Libya and the Ethiopians, right? We've seen them met, uh, mentioned in Ezekiel 38, shall follow at his heels. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him, therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. This is where I believe he, you know, where it says in Ezekiel 38, I put hooks in your jaws and I drew you out. So he's going to draw the anti mashiach out from the nation of Israel, his armies. He's going to go out and he's going to, what it says here, pit, plant his tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. Okay. So I believe that there's a possible connection with Ezekiel 38. This is the coming out, the drawing out, the, the hooking of the jaw and drawing him out. All right. And then when he sees that uh, he needs to try and come back into the city to take Israel, this is when I believe Yeshua will stop it. Okay, This is where it says in the book of Revelation that he'll take half the city, but Yeshua will be on his way back. Right, 
he will be coming up from Basra, bringing the, the people that have been scattered, the people of Israel that have been scattered. And so he will eventually, as it says in Zechariah 14, touch on the Mount of Olives and split them. He'll defeat the armies there, defeat the war, and then the millennial reign will come. So uh, definitely I think there's a connection here with this and Ezekiel 38. All right. All right, so we're back in Ezekiel 38, uh, again, with verse 7. We've read this, but let's read it again. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies, speaking of Gog here, that are gathered about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many peoples on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate, they were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops, and many peoples with you. Thus says Yahweh, on that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind, and you will make an evil plan. You will say, I will go up against land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell in the midst of the land, Sheba, Dedan, and the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take away plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, all right, thus says the Lord Yahweh, or Yahweh Elohim, on that day when my people of Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Then you will come from your place out of the far north, okay? Could this be speaking of the area of Mount Hermon? I do believe it can be the northern part of Israel. Okay, This is uh, where Baal's throne was. This is where the angels came down and had their congregation where they decided to um, do that evil deed, I think, in Genesis chapter 6. Okay, and Could it be speaking of that? That's where the anti is going to come from. Um, it's very possible, right? If this is speaking of Revelation chapter 20, verse 8, that would also make sense too. All right, if this is speaking of Satan coming from that area, obviously Satan is the one that gave his authority and everything to uh, the anti mashiachs kingdom. So there's a lot to talk about and think about. I mean, that's why I kind of go back and forth. Is it the end of the tribulation period? Are we speaking of the anti mashiachs kingdom here? Is he Gog? Or are we speaking of Satan, the serpent, as Gog? Um, you know, I mean, that's kind of, we're kind of go back and forth here on it. But I believe it's one or the other. And so, uh, can it be, in a sense, both? Can we have a double prophecy here? Uh, it's possible. It's possible we could be seeing two events happening. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. So it says here that you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people, Israel, like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O God, before their eyes. Thus says Yahweh Elohim, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who's prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them. Okay, This is speaking of Gog. I do not believe that Yahweh is speaking of Russia here, that he has told his prophets that he would be speaking of Russia coming down from that extreme north and, and so forth. Uh, so people try to connect this with Russia try to connect this with a leader of Russia, Putin or whoever, it would be a leader of Russia, that that's where it's going to come from. I don't think so. I think that that is not a strong argument. Now, modern-day Turkey and that area, where the seven uh, assemblies were, where it's the seat of Satan, I mean, there's a lot to think about there. Then, again, you got Mount Hermon there. 
and the traditions that surround that, uh, being the uh, throne of Baal. Okay, so there's a lot of tradition and a lot of pagan connection to there too. Both of those are in the extreme north there. And again, read Isaiah chapter 14 talking about uh, Lucifer, son of the morning, who wants to uh, have his place in that far north among that congregation there. Okay, I believe it's all of fallen angels there. So something to think about something to think about but I think the stronger argument moves away from Russia what we are seeing today is a war it's a horrific war and it could be pushing us towards the tribulation period of course but I do not believe you will see Russia involved now before I end one of the final things that some people like to say is you know Russia oh that's the bear in Daniel you know in the book of Daniel so that's connected to the bear the bear Russia you know, so let's go ahead and talk about that real quickly. All right, so here we are in Daniel chapter 7. Okay, and we're going to start with verse 2, where it says, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first one was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it and suddenly another beast a second like a bear it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth uh, between its teeth and they said thus to it arise devour much flesh after that I looked and there was another like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night vision, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking into pieces, and trampling the residue of its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. So for me, this fourth, uh, this fourth beast here that doesn't have a name, is going to be directly connected to the anti mashiachs kingdom in the end. He is the little horn that rises among the ten. Okay, We don't have the ten horns yet. We don't even have the little horn yet. All right. So this is the final manifestation of the anti mashiachs kingdom. If anything, this would be connected to Ezekiel 38. Okay, Nothing about Russia here. They try to connect Russia to the bear because, of course, Russia symbol is a bear. But as we're going to see, this bear represents the Persian Empire. It represents the Medo-Persian Empire. So it's not connected to Russia. Okay, not connected to Russia. Now, let's go ahead and go down here a little bit farther. Okay, verse 15, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the vision of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which rise up out of the earth. But the saints, or the holy ones of the Most High, shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all others exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke into pieces, and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth, which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. So if I am correct, and the little horn is the anti mashiach to come in the future, when these ten kings form, which they have not formed yet, three will be plucked out. As the little horn rises, this has not happened yet. And this is speaking of the fourth beast. So we are not there yet today, in my opinion. All right, let's move on here. 
I was watching, and that same horn was making war against the saints or against the holy ones and prevailing against them until the ancient of days came and a judgment was made in favor of the holy ones of the most high and the time came for the holy ones to possess the kingdom and thus he said the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth which shall be different from all other kingdoms okay it's going to be different than the bear the lion and the leopard it's going to be different than those okay Trample it into pieces. It's going to devour the whole earth and trample it into pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall rise up uh, from this kingdom and shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones. He shall subdue three kings. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the holy ones of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws. Then the, the holy ones shall be given into his hand for a time times and a time of hand the land of israel will be given into his hand and all of those that are pro-israel these include believers in yeshua okay but the courts shall be seated and they shall have dominion to consume and destroy it forever then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under whole heaven shall be given to the people the holy ones of the most high his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him okay this is the end of the account as for me daniel my thoughts greatly troubled me and my countenance changed but i kept the matter in my heart all right let's read on so as daniel is uh he's going to receive another vision here all right Try not to read the whole thing here, but in verse 3 it says, Then I lifted up my eyes and saw there standing beside the river there was a ram, which had two horns, and the two horns were high. One was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand it. Nor were there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considered, and suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a notable horn between its eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and the ram and ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confront the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but to cast him to the ground and trample ground and trample him. There was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore, the male goat grew very great. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken in its place. Of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven, and out of the one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east and toward the glorious land and it grew up to the host of heaven and it cast down some of the hosts of some of the stars to the ground and trampled them he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down because of the transgression an army was given over to the horn to oppose the daily sacrifices and he cast truth to the ground he did all this and prospered all right so again we have the two animals we have the ram and the goat okay the ram has two horns it's broken that is going to represent the bear that's going to represent persia the ram is going to represent yarvan okay and which is often connected to greece the empire of greece okay and from that area of the land of greece which is also the land of what Turkey, modern day Turkey, uh, is where the little horn comes from. The little horn comes out from under that kingdom. Okay. Now, it literally will tell us here, if we look down a little bit further, he says, The ram which you saw having two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is the kingdom of Greece, or Yarvan in Hebrew. The large horn is between its eyes is the first king. As for the broken horn, 
and the four that stood in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of the nation, but not with its power. And then it says, in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their fullness, a king shall arise having fierce features. This is the anti-Mashiach here. Okay, But I wanted to really focus on the ram being Medo-Persia and the male goat being Greece. Because this is what we're coming up with. So the ram here is Persia, which is related to the bear, the Persian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, which is also related to the arms of the statue in Daniel chapter 2. You see, what we have here is we have the statue that starts off in Daniel 2, and then we have a repeat of these empires, okay? Just giving you different forms and different picture language of these same empires, Trying to connect Russia just because Russia has a symbol of a bear simply makes no sense. It's you're just reaching for straws, uh, grasping for straws is you know usually how it's said. But there is no connection here. This is talking about the Persian Empire, okay? But what people want to say is, well, when you look at the Persian Empire, there's little bits and pieces of the Persian Empire that stretched into the USSR. And so that helps to connect that to Russia because just little pieces of the land there compared to the vast amount of the Persian Empire uh, is was connected to, you know, the old Russian Empire. And they think that Putin, of course, wants to take everything back and he wants to control all of that, <clears throat> excuse me, that land that he once, once controlled. Okay. All right. That, again, is a huge stretch. Let me go ahead and show you on a map here. All right, so here we have the old Persian Empire. Now, the Persian Empire in today's terms would be modern-day Iran, okay, modern-day Iran. And we know how Iran is, you know, in the news today and what it wants to do to Israel and so forth. All right, so that would be what would represent the bear. That's what the bear is trying to represent is the Persian Empire, meaning that, that uh, over there in Shushan and over there in modern-day Iran, that was the headquarters. That was the area of the throne of the kings of Persia who ran things. Okay, But what some people want to do is they look at this Persian Empire over here on the left, and then they look at the Roman Empire, and they'll say, well, look how some of the boundaries kind of dip into the old Russian Empire. And, you know, because Russia's a bear, you know, that'll help complete the picture there. Uh, that is a huge stretch. Okay. Number one, we're looking for the what? The fourth beast. The fourth beast is what's being spoken of in Ezekiel 38. It's being spoken of as the anti mashiachs empire or Revelation chapter 20, verse 8. The final uh, battle that happens at the end of the millennial reign. So for me, this is a huge stretch. Even some maps might say the Persian Empire dipped into Ukraine a little bit uh, you know, so you might get a little bit of Ukraine up here that might have been part of the Persian Empire when we look at these maps uh, here over by the Black Sea. Okay, but not, you know, this map does not show that. It doesn't believe that the Persian Empire went up that far. So this is just a real stretch. Okay, these connections that they try to make with Russia just doesn't pan out. All right, if anything, it'll be... Um, Iran in the mix, but it may not even deal with Iran. The bear may not even be in the equation. We don't know. Okay, If the bear is in the equation, it points towards the Persian Empire, which means it would point towards the leadership and rulership of Iran, not Russia. Okay, So, to me, I get what they're trying to do. I get what they're trying to say, but one by one, it just becomes a weak argument in my opinion, but we will see, you know, if they're right, it will pan out in the end. But as of right now, it's looking weaker and weaker. Even as this war goes on, it's looking weaker and weaker. So this is my opinion on the matter. And like I said, even of those of you who disagree with me and hold to the position that Ezekiel 38 is speaking of Russia, um, you know, we can still be friends uh, in the kingdom, we just have a disagreement on this particular interpretation. And I think 
I'm going to start seeing people start backtracking uh, in the next coming years here, or at least trying to scoot around it. They're going to try and make up some things about you know how they still think it fulfilled it or whatnot, but we'll see. Amen. So I hope this was helpful to you. Um, I hope this brought some peace to you. There is another view. Uh, we are not as close as what people think we are. Okay. There's still many things that still have to happen. Uh, could they happen rapidly? Sure, they could. I'm not going to leave that out. I mean, things could that the you know we don't have the ten horns, but that could happen rather rather quickly. We'd have to wait and see. But as of right now, we don't have it. So. Uh, but I hope this was helpful to you. Amen. And uh, feel free to comment in the comment section on my YouTube channel or whatnot and, and give your opinion on it. I'd be happy to read it and hear about it as long as it's cordial. Um, I'm not calling anyone who disagrees with me a heretic, and I hope no one would call me that. This is just doing our best to uh, talk about end times prophecy. Amen. So until we meet again, everyone, shalom.